Hello, I'm Natasha Foreman. Welcome to the Breaking Bread with Natasha podcast, where I share daily devotionals from my namesake blog. So you can listen on demand to spiritual messages inspired by God's love as expressed in the Bible and other religious texts. You can read along at breakingbreadwithnatasha.com or sit back and take in the word. Either way, I'm blessed to have you break bread with me. Without further delay, let's begin today's message. Welcome, Breaking Bread family. We're going to do something a little different for today's message. The last message, I shared a layer of information for greater insight as to why portions of the letters from Paul to the Ephesians and Corinthians and others have continued to cause confusion and conflict in the church community and our homes. The same is true of some parts written in the letters identified as 1 John through 3 John. Why do some of these authors' words keep the riptides of chaos churning? Why do men and women, husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends keep tussling over the language, interpretation, and perceptions drawn from these and other letters? Remember what I said in the last message. Context is required for perfect understanding. Let's go back to what many people would call the beginning of mankind, what others would call the beginning of the Israelite genealogy, or what some would simply call a great cautionary tale. Let's look at the foundation of our issues. The screw up in the Garden of Eden. Adam, Eve, and the curse that haunts. For those of you who read the book of Genesis, you know that it is said that God cursed the serpent, Adam and Eve, just Chava for their sins committed in the Garden of Eden. The curse on Adam and Eve created friction and struggle between husband and wife where they would, there would be difficulty in unity just as God later disrupted the plans for the Tower of Babel through separation of the people and division of their languages. You can't bypass God to get what you think you're entitled to. Adam and Eve chose flesh and to reason within their mind without deferring to and reconciling all with God. Neither took responsibility for their decisions. Eve blamed the serpent for her failure, and Adam blamed God and Eve for his. Even with Eve making a choice that went against God, Adam had a choice to hold her accountable and defer to God, choosing obedience to him over the temptation of the flesh. God created them to be partners, stewarding and managing together. However, they were to be united under one mind, his. They were to put him first above all things, including each other. They didn't choose him. They listened to the serpent. They put self before him, flesh before him. So cursed they became. This is still our struggle today. If we're to break the curse, we need to remember who we are and how we're to live and love God, ourselves and each other. We have to remember our original design, purpose and relationship. We have to live putting God first and always and deferring to him in all matters. Then we must live accordingly and with accountability. In our next message, we're going to dig deeper into what that truly means. Until then, let's begin to wrap up our time today with some reminders. If you're married or engaged or planning to be, then you must remember that You are not the master of your spouse. You are not their God. If you can't see them and treat them as equal partners, not just in division of labor, but in matters of the heart, then you need to turn to God for redirection. And just as you aren't their master, their Lord, their God, they aren't yours. You are not the tail that they wag and vice versa. We'll dive deeper into this in future messages. Managing Outsiders. When it comes to people outside of your marriage, you must remember that no other person should ever have priority over your spouse. They should never, ever be in a position where they could cause disruption on any level in your relationship. They shouldn't have access to you like your spouse does. There shouldn't be a familiarity and intimacy that even comes close to what you share with your spouse. You are responsible for creating, reinforcing, and maintaining healthy boundaries. 
Just like you don't want Satan involved in your relationship with God, keep that raggedy jerk out of your love life with your spouse. Satan might tempt, but you choose to be faithful or stray. You can only entertain the temptation if you're giving him your attention. Remember Adam and Eve, they got it wrong. If you're single and want marriage, you aren't married or engaged yet, but you're thinking about one day making that leap. Begin living your life like you're an honorable and faithful husband, wife. Be that faithful bride of Christ. Be what you dream of receiving. Begin living with those reminders that I just shared for married and engaged people. Look at this as a long-term boot camp. Your heart and mind need to be dialed in, aligned, and prepared for the attacks that will come your way. You will be tempted, but are you relying on God or your own devices to see you through? Give God your whole heart so that it can be aligned with another heart that complements yours and yours theirs. If you're looking for a person to complete you, then you need to postpone marriage until you either allow God to fill your gaps or you rely on him to get things done along the way. Don't think that marriage can fix you or the person you love. Just like children can't fill those holes, neither can your spouse. It comes down to you and God working it all out deep down in the trenches. So make sure you're in this to win this soldier. What we all must do, even if you have no desire to marry or remarry, you play a role in this construct and how it's portrayed. We all must rewire our thinking about marriage and this narrative that plays out as man ruling woman and woman sheepishly slaving the man as though she's a farm animal. Also, stop seeing marriage as man being the sole provider of all things and in all ways to the woman. It puts both in a position of lack. It isolates and separates both people. It leaves you vulnerable to attacks by the enemy. It's a recipe for disaster. It also contradicts the Genesis narrative, the story of the Proverbs 31 wife, and numerous examples compiled in the Bible and other religious texts. As I reveal and explore in my Seek Him book series, nothing in that distorted arrangement that I've mentioned that people keep pandering looks like God and his marriage design. We have perverted it. We have cheapened it. Just as someone doubted the words that God spoke through the prophets and chose to modify to their liking, someone has done the same by doubting God's desire for man and woman to rule this earth as equals, side by side, with woman representing the true intention behind the word ether, and not what man devalued it to be. If God used the word ezer to describe himself, then why have we perverted his meaning and chosen instead to use it to make the woman small and insignificant? It's because of what's in the hearts and minds of man. And if God's not in it, then we know it just ain't right. That means we must align and get back to where God wants us. God did not bring you together as a couple for you to neglect, abuse, belittle, take advantage of, and hurt each other. That's not the type of relationship he wants to have with you, so it can't be what he wants for you and another. You must choose to either follow God or the enemy. You can pray for healing and do your part for restoration or do nothing and watch everything wither and die. It's your choice. We have options. So choose. In our next message, I look forward to the chat. I will warn you now, it may, it may sting some of you a little harder than others. The truth has that effect, like rubbing alcohol on an exposed sore. Just breathe through it. I've been praying on it. I got a little anxious, but I reminded myself to breathe and let go and to let God. Let's do some prayer prep. I want you to, to take in this prayer below with passion and conviction. Even if you aren't in a relationship right now, pray it with a focus on your future. Pray with an understanding that you are first and always his bride. Declare God's love and protection over you and your significant other, your relationship with them and your relationship with God. 
Let's do this. Father, I pray that your love as demonstrated through and by your son, Jesus Christ, touches and warms my heart and the heart of the one I love, that we treat and love each other the way you love us and how we should love ourselves. I pray that we put in the time and care to nurture each other the way that we are supposed to care for and protect our own bodies. That when we see something is wrong, we work together with you to do everything in our power to make things right, surrendering what we can't to you. Father, I want to protect and be protected with a focus on protecting our relationship with you and our union together. It is my belief, Father, that no one should be able to penetrate a relationship when a couple is united in your love and devoted to living the life you have gifted. It is our choice to let that person in. It is our choice to give in to temptation. I pray that we keep our eyes and hearts focused on you, Lord. Keep us pointed in the right direction, Father. I praise you today and each day. Amen. And with that family, I pray that you are blessed, that you see and embrace your blessings, and that you are blessing the others. I love you all. Take care. Hi family, if what I shared in today's message resonates with you, I hope you will share it with others. Feel free to leave positive comments and reviews on my site, breakingbreadwithnatasha.com and through whichever podcast provider that you're listening to me. Each day I work to be a better steward and servant. I hope you will join me in sharing God's love and truth and rebuking the enemy's lies. Now go out there and make today an awesome day. I love you all.